But 1957, when they came to power, they did not know what to do with power. They were only opposing. Like in TSS, you'll find everybody is talking about critical consciousness. Critical consciousness, you can oppose everything, but you don't talk about what is the responsibility, social responsibility, a student community should take place. That's not discussed actually. So it's the same case. They were all opposing. Uh, but the social responsibility, especially in, in your, in the, when you are ruling, they never knew how to rule. The communists never knew how to rule. No. Uh, so then, the, that is one side of the ministers who were ruling. Rest of the communists were uh, sitting at home. They had no work. But because they cannot oppose your own party in, in, in power. It was a very strange situation. So what did they do? They, they were home, they were not in jail, they were not underground, they were at home. For the first time in their lives, they were spending time in their, their houses. So they produced children. And I was born like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and if, I, if you look at 1958, 57 was this, and 58, so many communist leaders had children. I can give you a whole list, I don't want to bore you with that. Huh? Because they were all at home for the first time in their lives. And uh, then a, a different history takes place. So my, uh, that history, that communist movement became part of the establishment. Parties. Earlier CPI, then CPM, all became part of the establishment actually. They were looking at power, they were looking at party elections. Uh, and uh, involvement in social issues became uh, uh, a need for generating votes. So power was the central uh, agenda. And 64, uh, the communist movement split, CPM came out, it was split like uh, if you have a hierarchy like this, it is split like this. So CADA went to spend, uh, CPM, the leaders went to CPI. CPI became a party with a lot of leaders. CPM became a party with a lot of CADA. 67, the ML movement came out. Naxal movement came out with Naxal Bari. At that time, uh, these confusions, there's a lot of history to say anyway. Uh, I was not political at all. I became political. My father died at the age of uh, uh, 64 and during emergency in 1976, 65 to, uh, 75 to seven, uh, 77, 18 months, we had emergency. Till then I want to, none of, none of his children were political. Uh, they wanted to wear flashy dresses, and be in the mainstream. The parenthood was different. You know. uh, both father and mother were different, but children were different. But uh, to me, something remarkable happened because of emergency. I saw what the state can do to all of us on individual terms. You know. State intrudes on your personal freedom in a major way. And there was a kind of renaissance of uh, students and youth uh, at that time during emergency. During emergency, you know, I, I'm a filmmaker, but uh, I think oral communication is the best communication, the most reachable communication even today, with all the technological advancement of Facebook and uh, Twitter and everything, because it's more human. And uh, all the technological advancements should be adding on to uh, the oral human communication. If it doesn't take place, it is useless. It can be dangerous also. Yeah. So, now the point uh, I'm trying to say is that uh, emergency, we had an experience of a, a student who was tortured and killed. His name is Rajan. So much of uh, problems took place during emergency on violation of freedom. And uh, activists uh, uh, initiated one slogan, whisper campaign. 
It was a Where is that? He was tortured and killed in uh, Kakkaim camp in North Kerala. Several other, some of my friends were also tortured. I don't want to go into the gruesome details. Uh, but what uh, uh, happened was this whisper campaign. Where is Rajan? That's all, whisper campaign. That brought down the entire government in Kerala. The, all the uh, newspapers were silenced. The famous saying, when journalists were asked to knee down, they crawled. That was the famous saying at that time. Everybody crawled in front of Indira Gandhi. Now we are crawling under Modi now. Same. And uh, uh, because you have something like demonetization from the first big convert, all the streets of India have been to protest. But nobody did it. We lost the chance. We are crawling. So, uh, why it happened? How did this whisper came, campaign became so powerful? The human to human connection was established from Kerala to Delhi to Delhi to Punjab, Punjab to all your places, uh, all over in Tamil Nadu, everywhere people became united, irrespective of their political differences and united, stood united against authoritarianism, against dictatorship. They found the value of freedom. What freedom means today? And essentially, students and youth played that role. And uh, the Kerala government collapsed because of that, and Indira Gandhi also collapsed because of that. And I'm sure if that power is established, of human political power, in addition to technological film or Facebook or anything. But a human power has to be established. Then Modi will crumble like nothing. I'm 100% sure about it. Now, after that phase, you find all over India, a renaissance of uh, youth and students' movement and consciousness and all that. I was in JNU at that time. I was a registered uh, student in 77 to 80. Uh, though I was arrested, I spent my, most of my time in discussing politics or in library or in attending protests or getting arrested. All these things happened. Uh, uh, by by uh, that time, I was uh, I was working as a cartoonist also. I was freelancing with a lot of people. That's how I earned my living. And later, uh, since I was not, I didn't have the attendance and all that. I had to back out. And uh, I joined, uh, I came to Bombay as pre president cartoonist. That, day. that was a skill I had. Uh, that was the time I saw two films which were very precious in my life also. One was Anand Patwadal's uh, Prisoners of Conscience, which is on the emergency prisoners, I believe, which I was also involved with. So I could identify with the topic of Prisoners of Conscience. That is Anand Patwajan's second film. It was made in uh, That was made in uh, a, a made about emergency. Uh, it was made in 69. First film was called Waves of Revolution. It was not Anand's film. The two people made it. Uh, no, the other one. Sorry, Time to Rise. First film was Waves of Revolution. Time to Rise. Then this one. So, uh, Prisoners of Conscience. Second film at that time, which I saw in Bombay, two films I saw in Bombay, was uh, uh, called An Indian Story by Tapan Bose. Indian Story by Tapan Bose. These are two are documentaries. That documentary uh, uh, explicitly showed how Dalits were tortured by the police missionary in Bhagalpur police station where they were blinded with throwing acid on their eyes in the police station. They were all blinded. And uh, they were harassed because they were Dalits. And uh, when they asked for water, they, the police urinated in their mouth. Uh, this, is, this is a famous story. We just came. Uh, 
called weekly called Sunday at that time. It was a very famous weekly at that time. And there's two more documentary films. Uh, two more documentary films. And is it available in YouTube or something? I'm sure if you talk to the uh, media department, you'll be able to put out all this. Yeah. Yeah. Second, second movie you said and you used to and be Tappan Moves. Tappan Moves. Oh, okay. Both are alive today. Oh. Okay. Uh, now, uh, these were the early filmmakers who entered into the uh, modern era. Before that also they were active filmmakers. Mm -hmm. you know, they used films to be still with them. But the modern active filmmakers you'll find, these were the two milestones before me. Uh, so I uh, I was all already watching a lot of commercial films, also the art films, and I was also involved in politics, and I was getting disgusted with uh, cartooning as such because every day you're reacting on the politicians. Every day your cartoon is coming out in the front page of the newspaper, but it gives a kick for a small time. After that, it doesn't. I was finding a, a difference between between my politics and my work as a cartoonist in mainstream paper. This uh, two films I saw, by the time I decided that I will be making films. So when I went to Kerala, uh, I was supposed to, uh, from Creepers I was supposed to join a paper called Current, which like Blitz at that time. Uh, editor was Ayub Seth. Uh, he has a slightly progressive role, but it's all sensation media. In so uh, I went to, I said I will go to Kerala and come back. He said, join any time. Then, uh, there I picked up my old friends from JNU and all that. One of my friends had a regular item on camera. A regular item on was uh, outdated at that time. No, totally outdated. 16 frames per second, no sound, black and white. No uh, negative, direct positive. So he had a camera and he had the uh, 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 he had the projector and a splicer. That's all he had. So we wanted to make a film on uh, the people science movement, the cultural action of the people science movement which was going on. And uh, we didn't have money also. None of us had money. So we went to students, asked for support. People gave 5 paisa, 2 paisa, 1 paisa, 10 paisa. All this outdated now. 25 paisa. All this outdated now. We collected around 2,000 rupees. That is the first budget. My first film. Uh, that film was shown and the activists, uh, for them, it was quite seeing themselves as quite good and all, all that. And for us, the fact that you can make a film was something important. There was no uh, sync sound. So we used a, a deck and a record player. So the commentary was given in such a way that there was no need to sing. And the music was played by another musician. And it, that's how it was made. In my house it was made, the film was made, splicer and the cello tape. So you, you show the projector on the wall and then uh, stop it where it's needed, pull out and look at it. It's just this is the big, you know, uh, the negative, uh, the positive. And then you uh, break it, or you can bite it and break it, no problem. Then put in the splicer and put the cello tape, that's it. That's how the film was made. Then uh, a group in uh, Delhi uh, uh, heard about me, the kind of uh, 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 social, the idea was to make films for uh, people's movements and for people's movements and on people's movements. So uh, they heard about me and they said, hey, could you make a, a film on uh, same, cases PS organization in the last framework, people science movement. That was in 84, uh, for Durdashan. So I took it up and that is the first film, that, that gave a lot of credibility for the people science movement at that time. It was telecast and the group was also happy and then I uh, offered me another film. On a, uh, that time there was a uh, struggle of the Fisher people which I was also involved, connected. Uh, against trolling as a major issue. And uh, Norwegians were responsible for introducing the technology. And within the Norway scientists and others, there were a lot of criticisms. Norway themselves banned uh, 
technology restricted. But in, in, Kerala, in India, this has been going on. So there was a big, huge conference which is going on uh, on the impact of trawling and the fish of people's life. Whether they can make a film on that. I said, yeah, fine. Then we thought of making a film along with that, not just for the scientific machinery outside, also for the people's movement. That film is called We Who Make History. It was shown very widely at that time. And uh, Fisher People Struggle got a lot of mileage. A lot of discussions took place after that. And trawlers were controlled. Government also took a stand. Uh, the demand was uh, to control trawling for three months in the breeding season, from June, July, August. Uh, but the government accepted for controlling for cut days. That is still continuing. But that was an experience where I uh, understood that uh, in terms of human knowledge, what is human knowledge actually? See, the entire spectrum of human knowledge that you see, what we know, is a small fraction of what we don't know. And what we know, built-in knowledge, you look at all the libraries of TSS, JNU, everything, put together, all international Oxford library, all put together, what we know, humankind. The small spectrum, written knowledge. The small uh, spectrum, entire uh, of entire human knowledge that is here now. The unwritten knowledge is far higher than all written knowledge. Those who are interested in doing PhD, all that, one must recognize this truth. You have a whole spectrum of uh, unwritten knowledge, in this, uh, uh, which is not documented in any written form. What the universities normally do with PhDs and interests, all uh, that, you know, just reproducing and rehashing the same knowledge again and again. Beyond that, they don't produce knowledge. And very few, they produce new knowledge. Uh, exceptions are there. But if you look at the unwritten knowledge, you know, on the fisher folk, I found fisher folk, uh, 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 see, I'm not a follower of Mao system, huh? but Mao asked one academician who pretended that he knew every, everything in the world. So he asked, uh, do you know carpentry? He said, no, I don't know carpentry. Can you, can you pl do plowing? No, I can't. I don't know plowing. Can you do farming? Eh, no, I don't know farming. Can you cook? No, I can't cook. And he asked questions like this, series of questions. Then he didn't know anything. But yet he was pretending to know everything. So Mao proved that he, this guy doesn't know anything. Mao's point was uh, that, that people have the knowledge. I'm not a supporter of Mao. I don't agree with Mao Zedong on many grounds. I believe that Mao Zedong was responsible for conquering Tibet. That's all there. But this is very unique about Mao, which is said out in terms of respecting people's knowledge. So in the fisher folk are today, even today, they fish with changes of the color of the sea. The oil sardines, when they come, they, they become slightly darkish in uh, See, you can see the So look at the color of the sea, the sound of the sea, certain fish create sound, and the smell of the sea. These three things even now, in Tamil Nadu, in Kerala, see the, the traditional fish of people are from Orissa to Andhra to Tamil Nadu to Kerala to, up to, uh, say, Karnataka and southern Maharashtra. Then it's, traditional fish of are more or less uh, Debunked. So all these places you will find immense knowledge of the sea, which the uh, marine scientists don't know. You know I have enough uh, evidences on that, that they know that uh, what is happening in the bottom of the sea, changes of the sea, they have full knowledge. They come back from the sea, uh, when they come back at night, it's all, it's all uh, dark. They look at the stars and come. They reach their houses straight in front of them. How do they do that? They know astronomy. You know, 
all that they are very clear about. They look to the stars and come to their houses. When we, when we are going, they, they say from this stone to that stone, eight kilometers inside the sea. And they say, I don't see any stone. Dhyanar Mastipo is a, is a landmark. You say from Dhyanar Mastipo to RK Studio, we can understand. Those no? landmarks. But when you go to the sea, it's all waves, nothing else. But there's this stone to that stone, they say, some name. They know stone here, and they stop at certain levels, and there's a, there's a uh, ship down below, ship right down below. You know? So they know everything under the sea, how the sea bottom works, how the contents are destroyed by the uh, trawlers, modern technology. Because the proms are destroyed, uh, breeding grounds are destroyed, they are on the bottom. So you have a, a safe, and then you have uh, rocks, you have forest inside the forest, uh, inside the sea, all that. These are breeding grounds. Inside. So they get destroyed by the bottom mm -hmm. trawlers, and they know what it does to see. And they, I, I'm not going in detail, it may bore you. Because these are all my pet topics and all that, sorry. So what I'm trying to say is that there is people's knowledge which is in abundance. In Pune, somebody is coming from Pune here? No. No. I thought so. In Pune, there is a Dalit group, uh, Dalit women in one municipality, one community. The women do the chakki grinding and, and they uh, uh, sing songs when they are doing so one group uh, located, uh, documented the songs which they sing. Around 40,000 songs were recorded. They are all illiterate. Illiterate women recollected around 40,000 songs. From which you can uh, look at the history from 6th century onwards. You know, that knowledge, so much of knowledge was there in that, the songs itself. So how we communicated as societies in this subcontinent called India, it's not a country, is uh, we communicate through songs and stories. Everything is there. You know, it is there with Dalit community, it's there with the uh, Fiji community, it's there with uh, uh, Adivasis, all. You know, you go to Kani tribe, you have a problem, they pluck some leaves and give you the treatment. Anyway, one of my friends have got a menstrual problem. Many of my friends at your age have menstrual problems. Adivasis have the treatment in Kerala, in, in uh, Tamil Nadu, in Andhra, in Kurg, the Adivasis that I know. They have the treatment. Modern medicine can, can give you only pain pills. So knowledge uh, that people are accumulated over here, these are knowledge which has been transferred for thousands and thousands of years, which are far superior, I believe. It's not, it's unwritten. Because it's unwritten, they don't have a history. You have, what is the biggest uh, 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 mass murder which has taken place during the colonial regime? If I may ask you, every will say, Jaryan Balagar. Around 1000, 900 some figures, or 1000 some figures are available. Around 1000 people were killed. Something like 30,000 people were killed uh, during, uh, by the Britishers during Santal War. But that is never quoted in history, at least in the textbooks. Historians have recorded it, but in our textbooks they don't produce it. Why? Because they were Adivasis. The biggest uh, protests which took place against uh, uh, colonialism started with the Muslim community from 1498 of Vasco de Gama. Then the Adivasis involved, uh, Dalis got involved. Apakas came up much later, in the mid 19th century to 20th century. The Gandhi Pan came up. So we say the freedom struggle is this. But we don't recognize the around 100 people's movements in Jharkhand and even Maharashtra, Kori, all the Adivasi and all that, you know. And Satishgarh. There were Veer Narayan Singh, so many other leaders were there who fought against uh, British, they were killed. We don't look at it as freedom struggle anymore. No. They don't, their families don't get any freedom fighters pension. Why? Because they are Adivasis. So Adivasis, Dalits, Christian folk, women, sexuality minorities uh, and a wide range of communities today in India do not have history. 
Karl Marx says in Communist Manifesto uh, that history of all existing societies is the history of class struggles. Now, my, my problem with Marx is only on that ground. If the class struggle is the only, only depicting factor of history, what about the history of Dalits, what about the Dalit history of women, what about the history of uh, Adivasis, uh, sexuality minority? All that have to be taken into consideration. Working class is only, not the only body. Now, you have prophets which have come up in ma major areas. My politics is just that you have to take up the positive aspects of Marx, Gandhi, Ambedkar, uh, Birsa Munda, Periyar, all the people, including Christ and Prophet also, that book. There are a lot of prof positive things in it. Forget that uh, we don't have to fight over the prophets. And if you look at uh, these prophets as uh, religious symbols, we are not going to learn anything in that. For the activist world, we have to do that. Coming back to films, films are uh, nothing uh, more than uh, activism. Film is also a kind of activism message. Film is a part of life, activism is also part of life. Beyond that, it is not mean a thing. Film is like cooking. If you want to cook sambar, you have to know, or if you want to make chicken curry, you want to know what to put when, how much to put when. Combinations you should understand. This is exactly the principle of film, nothing else. Only thing is you may cook sambar in half an hour or chicken curry in half an hour, but it may take two hours to make a documentary film. The principle is the same. <coughs> you keep tasting it in between. Some people do not have to taste it also. With the smell they can understand the salt or how much chili is there. I don't have that privilege. Uh, I don't have that kind of knowledge in my cooking. But I respect those people with such talents. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that creativity, if you look at creativity, if filmmaking is a creative task, <coughs> for me it's more difficult as a political task also. <coughs> it is a, uh, uh, the whole world out there which suppresses our creativity at every moment. Within the family system, within the education system, what they function that they do is to suppress the creativity in other words. They say you can't sing, <coughs> you can't dance. <coughs> you can dance, you can't sing. That kind of judgment is coming from the family system itself. In terms of competition, Many other societies that I have seen, you can see, you will find uh, everybody sings and dances. How is it like that? It's only on our societies, this specialization is coming. Out. Somebody can sing, but somebody cannot dance. Somebody can paint, but they cannot sing. Why is it like that? No. Human beings are essentially multiple creative beings. So, this multiple creativity doesn't come out. Why it doesn't come out? Because of this competitive world which is being created. So now, if Adivasi societies can do that, why can't we do that? This is a challenge to, uh, no, I would respect many of the Adivasi societies where, where uh, uh, displacement has not crept in, where mainstream has not gone in. They are very rich society. They, have, they, are better, they drink better water than us. They, they breathe better air than us. Their houses are more sustainable. They are not concrete anyway. Uh, their food is much more, uh, uh, you know, uh, healthy and also tasty. And their drinks are also much better than our drinks. Uh, booze is much better. <laughs> okay. So anyway, and the relationships are far better between men and women. Between the adults and uh, uh, children is far better. Between the adults and, uh, uh, you know, old people is far better. Uh, once uh, an Adivasi activist uh, told me, which I remember very clearly, it was an interviewing. I had the luxury of interviewing thousands of people in this country and many moments, many uh, things. So that is my learning process. Once an Adivasi activist, perhaps you know, may know, I don't want to tell the name actually <coughs> right now, because she got sold out to BJP now. 
she told me that generally to the middle class that you don't have to teach us about socialism because we practice socialism you don't have to teach us about feminism because we practice feminism you don't have to teach us about democracy because we practice democracy you don't have to teach us about human rights because we practice it you don't have to teach us about environment because we practice environment we have a vision of environment which you don't have we protect the forest so now broadly i would say agree with that though a lot of exceptional criticisms can come in in, in this framework my uh, relationship with both displaced adivasis as well as non displaced adivasis such as such in different parts in orissa chatisgarh uh, in uh, madhya pradesh kerala karnataka tamil uh, my my exp- and, and, and some normal i would broadly exp- uh, say that is right that value is right so now the point is that uh, what is it that the what, why do we hold written knowledge is the only form of knowledge which is uh, which is available to us in uh, in any form if i have to establish as a filmmaker it has to be written as a filmmaker you know otherwise i am not accepted as a filmmaker it doesn't matter how much films are shown he is a musician unless he is written that is a musician he won't be accepted as a musician it will be only a small crowd will be accepted the moment it gets written about someone he will get a lot of invitations this is the uh, why is it that the written knowledge gets so much of uh, prominence in this we have to uh, look into it in a very critical uh, vision uh, uh, it just confirms a validation it's a validation yeah. but in that validation you lose so much of knowledge yeah that is the only problem which i am saying even the names won't be accepted hmm. their religion is not accepted they all have different faiths it has nothing to do with uh, hinduism christianity or islam but when will they come adivasi if you are not christian or muslim then you are hindu they write hindu in the school forms when they enter that's not there the people are fighting against it in many places as so the culture is not accepted the language is not accepted and the medium of communication is not accepted i'll tell you some small story is a historical uh, story when the british uh, uh, started invading in jharkhand there was uh, 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 one priest who was supporting the adivasi struggles for the right of the forest now you have fra and all that fra was actually began in jharkhand you know right to forest resources uh, jharkhand movement initially it's a right of the community rights rather than a struggle against uh, britishers or national liberation struggle actually or birsa munda is treated as a freedom struggle for the he is he was talking about the freedom of the community not freedom of tamilians and much punjabis and keralites and all that mm-hmm. it was, so in that sense is not a national liberation struggle the community rights for the land water and forest that's what he, he was looking at odisha mein bhi koi tilkamaj tilkamaj is there many many symbols are there like that so now the point uh, what i'm trying to try uh, think that they, uh, during such protests one after the suppression of uh, birsa munda and the gang Uh, Birsa Munda's history is something if you read it's like a novel it's like fiction film actually you know? yeah. uh, there's a book by K. Singh if you read it it's much better than uh, uh, or uh, many other works which have which can, it's, it's, it's actually history history is unfolding like a novel and uh, one priest said you have to document it you have to use the ex- existing uh, institutions you have to fight using the existing institution we have to use the court he convinced the adivasi leaders so they filed a complaint at that time calcutta was the nearest court so they uh, they filed a case against this in calcutta court so they asked uh, okay so what is the proof that the forest belongs to you this area belongs to you what is the proof so they said we have uh, the or rocks of our ancestors and dead bodies are kept you know they that they that there always all, all the adivasi traditions there you know 
in Narmada, I made the first film on Narmada, 1988 to 90. At that time in Alirajpur, we went uh, quite inside, the vehicles wouldn't go, that kind of places. And people didn't have, most of them did not use money. There is no cash transaction actually. There is a cashless economy actually. Every Friday they will come and bring some roots or some vegetables or something, grains to they produce and then sell it in the market. Some coins they get and they buy something. Some clothes or oil or salt or some, you know, bangles or something like that. Friday market only. So they have to walk around 20 to 25 kilometers for that. Otherwise they don't have cash. When they come to the market, they won't have cash. When they go, there will be no cash. It's a cashless economy like Sweden, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, there I found, uh, most of the uh, Adivasis, when I asked the question, why are you fighting as Nar Narmada? Damn. I consistently asked all the Adivasis. All of them said, the most emotional thing they said, that our gods are dying. And what are these gods? If your father dies, they put a stone. And your grandfather is again like They all become gods. And like that you find, you find uh, the, your history, past history is with the stones. You can see the sto stones. They are all, and they are not, they are not a kind of god that we have. Actually, they are living. Nature is their god. Uh, nature is also god. Trees are god. Hills are gods. Uh, rivers are gods. Uh, goddesses. All that is there. So now point is that you have the history uh, with stones. Then you have your uh, 70 years or 75 years or 65 years that you live. Then you have future generations. So stones are a reminder, the gods are a reminder that your life is between the past and the future. The present is the past, uh, is a continuum of the past and the future. In our civilization that doesn't occur. Now, they think of the earlier past, they think of present means the entire life that you live and the future generations. So, that's their time span. Our time span, what are you going to do next year, what are you going to do, you don't know. Uh, after you pass out, what do you know, you don't know. You know the, so, we have, we are very, very short term memory, short term uh, time span, you know. But human life is located in the past, future and between that there is a present activity. So now the stones are very important in that sense to remind what kind of life we should lead. lead. Our relationship with the environment, our relationship to others, community, all that, the stones tell us. All, all sorts of memories are there, attached. it's nothing written. So that those stones, they said, Jharkhandi uh, Adivasi said, we have records, the stones are the thing. So that said, uh, you bring the stones. Uh, so they went the, in, 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 in Adirajpur and small stones. South India also very small stones. But Jharkhand is a huge stones, you know. They put huge rocks. So it's called, they call it Shashandri or something like that. So they brought these all, all big stones, carried all the stones across the forest and mountains and reached uh, uh, Calcutta. In, in the process, some of them died, all this happened. And they put all the stones in front of the court, Calcutta High Court at that time. And the judge finally came out to see the stones. He looked at the stones and said, yeah, but there is nothing written in it. So how do you say this yours kind of thing? Now, they don't have a written language. You know. So this is a, a catch 22 situation actually, you know. In terms of knowledge. So we have suppressed more knowledge than we have generated as such. The human history has suppressed more knowledge. With all the technological advancement, with all the writing skills, with all the libraries in this country or the world, we have suppressed more knowledge. We have suppressed more creativity than what we have created. That simple truth we have to accept it when we search for knowledge. In any social activism we have to accept it. In any creative action we have to accept it. So, uh, in, in, in terms of uh, your work, 
you know, uh, in terms of maybe what minimum thing I have heard from him uh, in terms of how students can be meaningful in social action and people's movement, how we can report. One thing I can promise you that if there's a good report or anything, we can publish it in countercurrents. That's it. It's written, it's okay, no problem. I'm not ideologically <coughs> against uh, written knowledge. <laughs> But we can also help in publishing it, okay. But the only thing is it should be written. The countercurrents.org website portal, is that right? Yeah. There is a global audience. It's called countercurrents.org. I am a volunteer as an associate editor. Editor is... Uh, Going ahead with a mission as a missionary. C O U N T R C U N T R R S contact currents C U I R E N T S dot R J contact currents. Yeah, it's one of the largest uh, alternative activist uh, uh, web channels. Focuses on the content focuses on. Uh, basically, we talk about all issues that we talk of social justice. Caste, communalism, nationality issues. Since you are a documentary filmmaker related to different social issues which are taking place in the society, how do you differentiate the art movies which are based on uh, social issues? How do you differentiate that from your kind of filmmaking? See, I, I don't uh, actually uh, differentiate. No. No, we don't want to know, we want to know hmm. what are the major criteria based on which, because uh, you are familiar with the grammars which you as a director follow when you are making a movie, documentary movie on a particular issue. At the same time, there are other art directors who are making so-called Bollywood movies on certain particular issues. Who is issue like a movie, two hours ago, movie made. At the same time, you are making a movie, a documentary movie on a particular issue of 45 minutes or one hour. So, what are the kinds of grammar or visual language you people are following? What are the differences? See, I see it like this. People like me are, uh, I would say, kind of uh, 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 representatives of third cinema. You have uh, commercial films on the one state jacket. Uh, so they look for commercial success. What is commercially successful is accepted. It has its own formula. Uh, and you have art cinema. Uh, how much festivals, how many awards you get. It has got its own formula. And people like us look at, uh, uh, you know, how much is uh, socially and politically relevant? That can be called so, uh, alternative films, activist films, so social uh, films on social issues, or any other name. It can be called third cinema. You know. So I consider myself as uh, uh, a third person here. So now uh, uh, I see positive aspects within the commercial cinema as well as art cinema. I don't reject anything. Uh, but there is a voice which is coming up from uh, this third cinema, especially in documentary cinema. For the last three decades have been coming out. When I entered, I was a loner, actually. But now there are so many people going ahead with camera and all that, you know. Now you can understand uh, uh, the voices from Gujarat on communal issues directly from the victims themselves. If you write a report on Gujarat, it is a secondary, uh, you know, source. But here you can listen to the victims directly through documentary cinema. Uh, from Bhopal, Bhopal gas chamber, so many people we have heard what they faced, what they struggled is about. So, anybody sitting in Kerala or Assam can listen to their voices directly. They can speak with their own language, with their own emotions. If you write about it, it's a representation. 
But here what you do is you create a platform for the uh, victims and survivors and struggling people to represent themselves and a platform will be created called Documentary Cinema today. <coughs> that becomes a, a bit more authentic than the written platform actually. You know, they may not be able to write but they will be able to speak because their, exper their living experiences are there which can be shared. So those are the kind of work which has been going on for the last three decades on women's issues, on working class struggles, Adivasi struggles, Dalit struggles, sexuality issues, uh, fisher people's issues, environmental uh, problems, farmer struggles, so on and so forth today. Developmental issues, what is the meaning of development, what are the victims? You can listen to Singur and Nandigram from their voices directly. You know. So this, this facility we have with video today, you know, and that has been experimented with many people today. Many youngsters are going, they are making films on mobile, mobile also, documentaries and all that. You know. Nothing happened, they put it up on the uh, YouTube or that. They, we can listen to that. The direct voices, what is happening. You know. So that, that kind of cinema, I would say, is the third cinema. You can call any name, it doesn't matter. <coughs> I wouldn't call it independent cinema because when I work with the uh, cinema, I'm dependent on my team, I'm dependent on activists, I'm dependent on certain people who have thought about the issue much more than me. I'm dependent upon the people's movement leaders. So I'm not an independent filmmaker. I'm only part of the process, you know. So I would say it's a kind of third cinema. So have you ever studied John Gears and the father of documentary? Yes. Sorry? John Gears of 1926. Ah. And from India. Ah, okay. what about, uh, what do you want to say? Means they are approached towards documentary by that time. How they approached making documentary and the how today's newcomer, how they are approaching documentary. Is there any landslide changing process which we are going to? How do you see that? See, I, I find there is a lot of difference actually in this actually, you know, in this question actually. See, I'll tell you one example. Uh, in uh, in uh, commercial Hindi cinema, uh, I would, ha I have a lot of respect for uh, R.K. Muthi, who shot uh, Gurdas films. Uh, it is called, uh, uh, two films let's say, Pyasa and Kages Ke Fuli. Today's came in, negative. Then 400 days came in, then 1000 days came in. When 1000 days came in, you can record candlelight. Okay. Then you have much more advanced technology today in, in video. This, this camera is much better in terms of light than the 50 ASA negative which R.K. Murthy used. So if you want to shoot outside somewhere, you have to know where all the light comes from, very carefully. You need extra sensory perception to shoot, it's not a joke, you know. So cinematography was a very specialized job, a lot of struggle. You had to wait for the sun to come properly, the proper situation to come, the clouds to disappear, otherwise you can't get it shot properly. <coughs> so you have, you have a lot of struggle to get a good shot. So cinematographers were used to struggle. When you struggle for a job, you become more qualified. Today with any mobile, there is no struggle. So you don't produce good cinematographers today. It is there. But if you look at the uh, uh, cinematography today, it is the most strict. It's like, uh, no, uh, uh, I, I would say, uh, very polished, you know, it doesn't stay in the memory, you know. It's like old songs, why people still remember it. It's a very difficult job, all, all the artists should sit together, you know. One person makes a mistake in a violin, then the entire song has to come out again, you know. 
One person makes a mistake. Now it's not like that. It's all. You make any mistake, no problem. You just uh, cut only that piece, and uh, nobody sits together and sings, or uh, no, that kind of thing. It's not. It's not needed. Technology has developed quite a bit. So you don't listen much about uh, the today's music as well as I see even the youth remembers older music. I asked a lot of youth which remember old, older music. Why are you looking at the older music? You are looking at my generation music. Why can't you listen to your generation music? Uh, in my generation, I never listened to the older, older generation music. I listen to my generation music. So it is something like this, you know, something which sustains how does a work of art sustains time space restrictions and that is a uh, catch for that there should be struggle if only if there is people are prepared to struggle you can produce result you can't do anything just like that you know whether it be activism whether it be art whether it be anything in life. The whole preparation of the struggle is more important. Internal, that patience is important, that determination is important. And also the kind of uh, uh, connection with the like-minded people, which keeps us generating energy all the time. We cannot be afford to be individuals anymore. So people have to keep reminding us, you know, uh, about our mistakes, about the life and encourage us, generate energy for us. Without that, nothing works. That is the scene of being. So that is the only difference I find. But at the same time, I find uh, in the new generation cinema, it's a new generation cinema, there are a lot of things which people like us don't have. Especially in the field of technology, they are much faster on that. Which I am still uh, uh, very illiterate as far as technology is concerned. Actually. I'm a filmmaker, but I'm illiterate about technology. So, a lot of the advantages the new generation has. Uh, their capacity to assume information is much faster than a person like me. The articulation skills are much better. All that I recognize. When it comes to dreams, I believe that we have deeper dreams. I still believe that. <laughs>